approach the text that we're going to be in this morning, kind of from a conversational standpoint, and uh, want to want to talk to you a little bit about boldness. And want to ask you a question: Have you ever, have you ever met somebody that's just very bold, very confident? Uh, when, when maybe hard times pressed against them, they were very bold, very confident, very sure about who they were and what was going to happen, and they really couldn't be shaken. You know, Paul was like that, and I want us to look, if you'll turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, and Paul is talking to the Philippian believers, so Philippians chapter 1 is where we're going to be today, we're going to look at verses 12 through 21. I want to do something a bit different, like I was saying. I just want to have kind of a, a conversation with you, but also a conversation with Paul in the text, if we could. And I want to examine Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 21. And I want to look at a few things. I want to look at what Paul wanted the Philippians to know, because of the letters to the Philippians. And then in, in seeing that, I'm not, I think we can really see what Paul wants us to know as believers. And I also want us to see what Paul himself knows. See, Paul says a few statements. He says, I want you to know something, Philippian believers, and I know something as well. We're going to look at those things this morning. And then finally, I'm going to ask you a big, colossal, huge, mammoth, elephantine, that's a word, giant question. All right? So we're going to look at those things, and then we're going to ask that huge, giant question at the end and uh, that we all can answer in our heads and in our own hearts. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on this message. Father, I come before you today and ask that you would speak to me uh, through the text like you've spoken all week. And Father, I pray that you would just communicate what you've communicated to me, to those in attendance today, that our hearts would be right and ready for what you have to say to us. And God, that we would just still our minds and help us to just get rid of any other distractions, help us to focus on you and what you would have to say to us. And we'll give you all the glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want to talk about a bold life. We're going through the bold series. And I want to just talk to you about Philippians chapter 1, 12 to 21, because I believe in this text, Paul gives us the information we need, the knowledge we need to have a bold life. And then we're going to ask that question. So Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, I just want to go through it little by little. But first I want to read the entire text. Uh, and it starts in verse 12. It says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren, trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. We're going to stop right there. We're going to backtrack a little bit. We're going to go verse by verse, like I said, conversation style, and I just want to go through uh, these verses and, and really just kind of get what Paul was trying to say, not only to the Philippian believers, and said we want to know what he was saying to them, but what he wants us to know, and then it all hinges on what Paul himself knows. So look at verse 12. What did Paul want the Philippians to know? What does Paul want you and, and me to know? This is what verse 12 says. Now, I want you to know, brethren. Uh, I set that up pretty well, didn't I? He says, I want you to know, brethren. What does he want us to know? You can do this through all scripture. Just ask questions. I want you to know that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. The first thing Paul says to the Philippians and to you and to me is, is, I want you to know my circumstances, the things that have happened to me, have actually worked out for the progress, the advancement of the gospel. The message of the gospel, Paul was taking that throughout the world, and, and he was wanting to go into east, into the east, into Asia, into that realm, and God said no, he sent him the other way to Europe, and, and, and the circumstances, if you want to take time today, I really encourage you to do this. I did this, and I was just amazed at what these circumstances were. Go back and, and sometime today, read Acts chapter 21 through Acts chapter 28. You'll see what the circumstances were, what Paul was going through. Basically, in a nutshell, Paul was going through a great ordeal. He had, he had uh, been basically wrongly imprisoned. 
He was facing uh, the, uh, the, the, the allegations, uh, uh, really, that were unfounded, things that really didn't have any base, other than he was preaching the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the Jews had accused him uh, of entering the temple and bringing Gentiles into the temple, but Paul didn't do that. And, and there was no real good reason that Paul was facing what he was facing, other than it was because of what Jesus Christ. And this is what he says. He says, I want you to know, brother, that my circumstances, his imprisonment specifically, his, his wreck, he, he was on a ship, and we talked about a little bit that, about that last week. His, his, all his circumstances, his trials, his difficulties. He says, my circumstances, they've actually turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Now, why is Paul writing this? Here's the reason Paul's writing this. You see, the Philippians, I believe, have wrote a letter to him via Epaphroditus, their pastor. And in this letter, I don't know for sure, but I think it probably went like this. Now, here's Paul in prison, and here's what the Philippians probably said to Paul in the letter. Poor Paul. I can't believe you're going through this, Paul. I can't believe that, that you're facing all these trials, and of all things, you're in prison. Maybe they question you and said, why would God do that to you? Paul was facing these trials, these circumstances, these difficulties, and the first thing he says back to the Philippians in his letter to them is, listen, I want you to know that those things that you see as bad things, those circumstances, they've actually turned out for the furtherance or the progress of the gospel. And then he goes on to explain it. Look at verse 13. He says, so that, there's a word in here that you're going to see repeated. It's the word T-H-A-T, that. And he's explaining the question, or he's saying this is the reason why. He says, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. So Paul says, listen, my imprisonment was for this reason. It was because of Jesus Christ. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not admitting any guilt. The only thing I did that they're finding fault with is I've been preaching Jesus Christ. So that's why he's in prison. He says, my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. Paul says, listen, this, this, this whole incident that you're so sad about, Philippians, it's well known. And the Praetorian Guard knows about it. Anybody know what the Praetorian Guard consisted of? The Praetorian Guard, they some say, was over 9,000 men that were specifically uh, associated with, with Caesar and, and, and the palace, and, and they were designed to protect that, and they were the elect of the elect. They weren't the Roman army. They weren't the Roman police. The Praetorian Guard were, were a distinct group of men who, who had a high responsibility, and it was a group of men that Paul probably never would have had the opportunity to witness to. But he says in verse 13, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And to everyone else is a reference to most of Rome. You see, this started to spread because people knew that Paul was in prison, not for anything real, but because he was preaching Jesus Christ. They understood that Paul was in prison and the Romans heard it and the Praetorian Guards heard it. Now think about this. It wasn't just like a, a dungeon prison or something we might think about in that day. What it was, was they basically chained his ankle to the ankle of another guard, another Praetorian guard. Okay? And, and, and for 24 hours a day, every day, Paul was chained to another person. What in the world do you think Paul talked about to that guy? Right? Four to six hours they would change. The guards would change. I mean, some people say four hours, some people say six, so we'll just go with five, right? Every five hours they change, the next person would come in, and I can just imagine that next person coming in, and the person that was chained to Paul for the last five hours going out and be like, you're in for something. <laughs> this is going to be funny, right? And, and they're probably like, man, Paul won't stop talking to me about Christ. He won't stop preaching to me about this Jesus. And, and surely some got saved, some accepted Christ, some trusted in Christ. And Paul says, listen, Philippians, you think it's bad that I'm going through these things, but God has meant it for good, and God is using my situation to glorify his son, and it's okay. And so that's the first thing that we see here, and, and, and you know, in reading this, I'm thinking, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to go ankle to ankle with some of you guys, so if anybody's willing, I'll do it hour by hour, and I'll preach to you about Jesus now. Sometimes I think pastors want to do that. They want to chain some people up to, to themselves. But Paul had the opportunity to do this. And Paul is, is, is basically given this opportunity to the elect and to um, the Praetorian Guard, a, a sect that he might not ever have the opportunity to preach to directly. But because of his imprisonment, he's able to. 
And he said, he continues in verse number 14, and that most of the brethren, trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So Paul says, listen, Philippians, there's two things going on. First thing, I have an opportunity that I might not have otherwise had. I get to preach to the Praetorian Guard and to Caesar's people and to Caesar himself possibly. Remember, he had gone through, if you go back and read Acts 21 through 28, he had gone through all these people. He had gone through Augustus and, and, and uh, Agrippa, and, and before long he would be before Caesar. And he's getting to preach to these people, and, and God promised Paul. He said, Paul, you're going to be my, my special person that goes and preaches not only just to the, the people, to the Gentiles, but also to kings. And we see here that that's being fulfilled. And, and then he says, and that most of the brethren, he's talking about other believers in Christ, look at verse 14, trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Here's another result of Paul's circumstances, Paul's difficulties, Paul's trials. The other thing Paul says is, look, Philippians, also, because of my imprisonment, some of you now have courage to speak about God, to speak about Jesus Christ. You see, I think there's two things going on here. I think sometimes I think some of the people might have been like, well, I'm not going to preach or speak today about Jesus because Paul's really good at it, and he's doing a bang-up job. But when Paul went to prison, Paul wasn't able to speak to those people that some of the Philippians could speak to. And now some of the brethren in Christ, some of the other believers, maybe got a little emboldened and said, you know what, Paul can't do it anymore, so I'm going to have to start speaking to people about Christ. I'm all that's left. And so they were emboldened and brazen to speak to people about Jesus, and they began to share their faith. And the, the, the word there, speak, is, is, I want you to note that. It's not preach. And there's, there's, there's distinction to that because what it's saying is that these people spoke about Jesus Christ in their everyday lives. They spoke about Jesus Christ in the marketplace. They spoke to other people about Jesus Christ in their jobs. They spoke to other people about Jesus Christ in their family households and, and in the normal day-to-day -day things that they did. They weren't up on soapboxes, I don't think. They weren't on a pulpit. They weren't, you know, a pastor of a church. They were just everyday people that because they saw Paul and they knew Paul's circumstances, they said, listen, now I, I can go out. I've got to carry that torch. I've got to preach the gospel. I've got to speak to people about Jesus. And I think the other thing they thought was, if Paul can be this encouraged, this bold in prison, how should I be? If Paul can go through these circumstances, he's been shipwrecked, he's been beaten, he's been you know, stoned, he's, he's been uh, just, just persecuted beyond all belief. Now he's about to face, uh, he's going to, about to go on trial and he's about to face possible death. If Paul can do that, shouldn't I be able to do that? And it gave him, it gave him courage. It gave him strength. That it, it, it charged him up a little bit. And he says, most of the brethren trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. They looked at Paul and said, if Paul can be in prison and he can go through that, surely I can speak Christ at my job. Surely I can speak Christ at my pickup game of whatever they play back then. You know, maybe they're practicing for the Olympics or something like that. And, and the normal, the coffee, the coffee shop there in, in Rome or in Philippi, and they go, and, and maybe they were just a little more encouraged to say, you know what, I can tell this person about Christ. I can tell the cashier about Christ. I can tell my best friend about Christ. I can tell my parent about Christ. I can tell my relative about Christ. Because Paul's in prison. He's not complaining. He's still preaching Christ. Even to the guards, I can do that as well. So we see that Paul in prison was actually encouraging some of the believers. Now, he, he says a little bit something else here in verse 15 through 17. Listen to this. He says, there is some, some, some things coming out of this that you wouldn't expect. He says, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress. In my imprisonment. He said some people are doing this out of a, an unpure heart. Some people were jealous of Paul. Some people looked at Paul and how well he taught and how much impact he had, and they thought, man, I'd like to be like that. Why can't I be like that guy? 
And we do that too as Christians sometimes, don't we? We look at other Christians and we're like, yeah, I would like to be like that. Why can't I preach like that person? Why can't I teach like that person? Why can't I have the gift of giving? And, and what, what Paul wants us to know and what Christ wants us to know is God has given you a specific gift. God has given you a special gift that only you can do to help build the body of Christ. And these people were, some of them were, were jealous of Paul and they were creating uh, the verse, they were creating a, a bad situation without, within the church. And, but Paul says, listen, even though it seems like they're doing this from bad motives, he says, the gospel is still being preached. And in this I rejoice and will rejoice. I want to make sure that people know about Jesus Christ, and that was Paul's ultimate goal. But I want to back up for a moment and think about you in this context. We think about Paul and his circumstances. Now, in your circumstances, think about your circumstances right now. What, what are your circumstances? You see, everybody goes through hard times, right? Everybody has a circumstance, quote unquote, in their life. What is your circumstance? If you had to pinpoint it, and I'm not asking you to ask out or say it out loud or raise your hand or anything, but, but think about the thing that you're going through this morning, this last week, this last, last month. What is it in your life that God has maybe put his finger on and said, I know this is hard. I know this is trying. I know this is troubling. I know this is not ideal for you. I know this doesn't fit into the American concept of what you want to feel. You know, as Americans, we want to feel comfortable, right? We want, we, we want the, the, the luxuries of life, the pleasures of life, the good things of life. Part of it is we've just been raised like that. Some of y'all, not so much. And, and, and my generation is benefiting from your hard work in a lot of ways. But, but I think we get to this place of, of comfort. We don't want anything to kind of get us out of that comfort zone, right? But it happens. It happens. Jobs fall through. Uh, uh, people, people act in a way they shouldn't act and hurt our, our hearts and our, and our feelings and, and, and money issues and, and car issues and house issues and, and all these issues in our life. And they press down on us and, and their circumstances like Paul was going through. Some are things we brought on ourselves and some are things that God just allows us to go through. But they're the circumstances of our lives. And Paul says, listen, these circumstances, Philippians... I've actually furthered the gospel. They've actually progressed the gospel. And what I want us to see this morning is that Paul is telling the Philippians, as well as you and I, he's saying, listen, your circumstances, the thing that you most hate right, in your, right now in your life, the thing you're like, man, God, why in the world am I going through this? That circumstance, that trial, that situation, that tribulation, God wants to use that to further the gospel. That's a tough pill to swallow, isn't it? That's hard to think about. That God would use the actions of someone else who is acting ungodly to further the gospel. That God would, would allow my financial situation or that person that hurt me, allow that circumstance to, to further the gospel. That, that's difficult to, to comprehend and to understand. But, but think about what Paul is going through. The guy, I mean, he experienced more than we will ever experience in our lives in terms of heartache and trial and persecution. And yet Paul used those circumstances. He said, listen, these circumstances are for the good of the gospel, the progress of the gospel. Maybe your circumstances are for this reason only. Maybe it's to encourage someone else. Man, that's, that's a heavy thought. That somebody might be looking at you, somebody might be looking at your life and saying, well, well I'm watching how you walk through life. I'm watching when things look hard, when things get hard, when things become difficult, when, when all seems lost, and that situation that you can't believe is happening is happening, and they look at you, and they're from the outside, and they say, what are they going to do? They say they believe in this Jesus guy. They, they believe in God. They go to church. But when difficulty comes, when that circumstance comes, when that trial comes, how do they react? God is constantly using your circumstances, your time, your trouble, whatever you're going through this morning, to maybe bring someone else to Jesus Christ. Wow. That should make that circumstance a lot more bearable, a lot more tolerable. You think about some of the things in, in our society, and uh, you think about things uh, in, in, in our churches, about what we complain about and what we what we kind of get agitated about, you know, my phone's not working today, and all the modern conveniences, oh, I didn't get the food that I wanted at the restaurant. And then you look at somebody's life like Paul, who was shackled to another human being 24 hours a day, and yet considered it a joy 
to be able to preach to that person, to share the gospel with that person. You know, I think Paul looked at it like kind of like this. You know, with a telescope, how many guys have ever owned a telescope? Okay. Most of us, I believe, how many look through a telescope? What does it do? It makes the things in the, in the, in the distance, in, in the distance way back there, the star, the moon, whatever it is, it makes them appear what? Closer, right? Bigger, larger, makes them appear larger. And, you know, Paul's life right here in your life, when we come into hard times and situations that we don't normally want to go through, we just, you know, would rather just be more comfortable. I think our lives can act like a telescope. See, to the world, Jesus Christ is far away. God is kind of unknowable. Jesus is not that big of a deal. But when in the crucible of our lives, when we come into contact with hard times, hard circumstances, hard trials, and God allows us to go through that, it's almost like a telescope that lets the other people in our lives, let unbelievers know and see Jesus Christ in a bigger way. See him for who he really is. That he is a God of love, that he is a God of empathy, that he is a God who cares about them and their situation. And we can show that to them through our lives, through our circumstances, through our trials. You can do it with a, a, a microscope as well. What does a microscope do? It makes the tiny thing look big, right? A microscopic thing look big. When you go through that difficult circumstance in your life, it's an opportunity to be a microscope, to show God big for who he really is. People look on and they see you and they see that, that testimony. They see how you're going through that trial. And they see even though things aren't perfect, you still are trusting in God. Still giving him the glory that he deserves. Let's continue in verse number 17. It says, The more we proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Verse 18, what then? Basically, Paul says, so what? So, so what of all this? He says in verse 18, only that, here's another that, that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Paul says, listen, no matter what happens, all these circumstances, all these trials, even though people, some people are doing it out of, out of a negative spirit, out of improper motives, Christ is still being preached. You know people can preach out of envy? Can you believe that? People in the ministry can preach out of envy. They can preach because, you know, that person is good at preaching, but I want to be better, and I'm going to be better, and I want people to listen, and, and it's the wrong motives for preaching. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't still work through that preacher because God honors his word, not the man. So, so, so we need to understand that, that in, this, in this particular passage, that Paul is saying, listen, these people are preaching Christ out of bad motives. Maybe you know someone like that. Maybe you know somebody that doesn't really want to do good, but they do good, and they're doing it for the wrong motives. You know, maybe you're here and you've served in a ministry of the church and you've done it so that people will say, look at, look at him, look at them, look at that person, look at their hand, let's give them a hand. And that's not proper motive, right? The motive should be to honor and glorify Jesus Christ and to bring lost sinners to Christ. That's the motive. And, and so when we get that motive, it's a good thing. But Paul says, look, look Christ is being preached. Don't worry about those people that are bad mouthing you. Don't worry about those people that are going to bad mouth you. The Lord will deal with them later. God does us the heart, right? But Paul says, Christ is being preached, and for that I rejoice. And he continues. He says in verse 19, look at verse 19. For I know what, here's the no part. Here's what Paul knows. For I know, what do you know, Paul? He says, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Or maybe some of your versions say salvation. Through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul says, look, Philippians, I know. That's confidence. That's boldness. I know. Without a shadow of a doubt, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, there's some debate on to, as to what Paul's talking about here when he says salvation or deliverance. It's not salvation in terms of uh, rescuing from sin. It's a deliverance, maybe possibly from his chains. A deliverance possibly from this earthly life. But here's what Paul says. No matter what, I know that I'm going to be delivered. I know that I'll be set free. How? Through your prayers. Don't let anybody ever tell you that your prayers don't matter. Paul asked for the prayers of, of all the people he, he talked to and wrote to and, and the churches he started. The prayers of the saints are so powerful. 
He says, through your prayers and through the provision of, of Jesus, the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul says, listen, I know that this is going to turn out for my deliverance. Where is he? He's in prison. And he says with confidence, listen, Philippines, I know. I know this is going to turn out for my good. I know this is going to turn out for my deliverance. It makes you think of Romans 8.28, doesn't it? Everybody got it in your head? They work together for good. To who, though? To those who are called according to the according to God, according to His perfect will. Those who are called in His will, those who are doing His will. It's not the person that says, "Well, my circumstances are messed up, so forget God. I'm going to do my own thing." No. Paul had confidence because he knew his confidence was in God. He knew who he believed in, and, and he knew who he trusted in, and he knew that he was preaching and doing the right thing, and in the center of God's will. And you and I can have confidence too. Even though our circumstances might look bad. Even though things aren't exactly like that we want them to be. Man, what kind of a mean God would that be if he let you have everything you wanted to have? Exactly how you want to have it. God is a good God. He says his ways are higher than our ways. He knows better than we know. And so he's going he's gonna to give to us, allow us to go through the things that we go through for our good. What, what is our good? So that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. We get messed up when we think that our good is more money. We get messed up when we think that our good is a better job. We get messed up when we think our good is someone that, that we need to meet and, and maybe marry or, or be friends with or be social status with. You know, if I could just hang out with this crowd, then everything would be good. If I could just get this car, then everything would be good. If I could go to this place and do this thing. And God says, listen, as a, as a believer, your greatest good is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Once that's in place... Then everything, your circumstances, your trials, your difficulties become clear. And it's easier to see that Christ is working in our hearts and lives. Why? Not for necessarily our good, but for his good and our good being formed into the image of Jesus. Keep, let's keep going. Verse 19. For I know that I will turn out, this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ. And verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope. Now, you should ask a question right here. Paul, what's your earnest expectation and hope? He answers it, that I will not be put to shame in anything. Paul says, listen, in my circumstances, I have such confidence in God that I'm not going to be put to shame. What does he mean when he says not going to be put to shame? It means that no matter what happens to him, God's not going to make a fool out. It's not going to be for nothing. It's not going to be in vain. You know, I believe God wants to say that to you today. If you're, if you're seeking Jesus Christ, if you're trying to be more like Christ, if you're walking in the Spirit on a daily basis, your circumstances are not in vain. They're not for nothing. They're not what the, the humanists would just say, well, it's just, it's just for your benefit to make you better and, and grow and, and for your sake. Or maybe it's just, it's just part of life. The Buddhists would say, you know, it's just because you're here, right here, right now. Enjoy the moment, good or bad, whatever. It, no. The purpose of your circumstance, the purpose of your trial, the purpose of what you're going through is simply so that, that you won't be put to shame, that God will be glorified in your situation no matter what happens because it doesn't matter on the outcome. It doesn't matter if you lose your job, you get your job, if you get more money, don't get money, find that person, don't find that person. The, the thing that matters is that Christ is glorified and you're made more like him. So Paul could say with confidence, According to my earnest expectation and hope. What's your hope, Paul? That I will not be put to shame in anything. And by anything there, he means either by death or by life. Whether he's set free or killed for what he's doing. And he says that with all boldness or all confidence, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. You see, Paul's objective in that situation, wherever he was when he wrote this letter, was was probably in prison, probably changed to somebody else. Still the guy there, he's like, that guy's always writing, right? He's writing with Philippians. He's writing with Philippians. He says, listen, even in this situation right now, Philippian believers, it's all right. Number one, I believe God's going to deliver me. Number two, I believe that, that even if he doesn't, he'll be exalted. Even if I die. Even if Caesar says, death to this guy. It's all right. Man, that, that's amazing to think about that Paul could do that, that Paul could go through that and have that type of mentality and that, that type of attitude. And we think, but that's Paul, <laughs> right? That's, that's the apostle Paul. He's like a spiritual giant. And what I want to tell you today is God has written this for you. 
He's told you this morning, you can do it too. If Paul can do it, you can do it. There's nothing special about Paul other than he knew Jesus Christ. And you can do the same thing in your circumstances. I can do the same thing in my trial, in my, my circumstances. I can, I can go to the Lord and, and, and I can ask Him for strength. And I can, through my trials, bring honor and glory to Him. He says, verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And I want to ask Paul, if he was here today, I said, Paul, how can you make such a bold and confident statement? Look what you're going through. Think about what you're going through, believer, in your life. And if you could say this, if you could say, you know, it, it's okay, it's all right, things are going to work out for my deliverance, it's all for the furtherance of the gospel. Paul, how can you be so darn sure? How can you be so darn confident? How can you be so bold in this to say that you're saying it, it's, it's okay, it's going to work out for good. How can you do that? He answers it. Look at verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is me. Paul said, listen, the, the reason I can make this bold claim in times of crisis, in times of difficulties, in times of, uh, of heartache, is that I have a single passion, a single desire. And here it is. This is, this is the crux of this whole book, all right? This is what this whole book hangs on. This, this phrase in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And, and some, some of the texts, the, the Masoretic texts, they, they believe that is was put in there to help us understand. So it could be read like this. For to me to live, Christ, to die, gain. Living is Christ, dying is gain. Living is Christ, dying is more of Christ. That was Paul's message to these Philippian believers. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I saw a, a commercial uh, for some new show that's coming on. It's about tree houses. And I mean elaborate, elaborate tree houses. And this guy, that's all he does. He's, he's dedicated his entire life to tree houses and making some pretty cool tree houses. And they were interviewing another guy about this guy that makes tree houses. And they said, what in the world is going on here? What makes this guy tick? And he says, so-and-so lives and breathes tree houses. And I thought, that's really silly. <laughs> I thought for a moment that they're cool tree houses, but this guy literally, that's what he lives for. He lives and breathes to build tree houses. He lives and breathes to, to make them and, and to see people maybe buy them. And he just take, gets a great, great joy out of making tree houses. And I thought, what about me? What about you? If I had to fill in a blank, for this verse, what would I say? See, Paul's confidence in times of crisis came from his single desire, his passion to know Jesus Christ and to make him known. That's what Paul goal, Paul's goal was. To know Jesus Christ and to make him known. Did you hear that? It shouldn't be foreign to us. We're, I believe we're all believers in here. And, and that's Paul's objective throughout all the scriptures, to know Jesus Christ and to make him known. Him know. And now I want to ask you that big, colossal, giant, mammoth, elephantine question. You ready? You sure? Are you ready? If you're ready, go ahead and give me a head shake. You ready? You sure? What are you living for? What are you living for? Now it's easy to say, I go to church, I do all the right things, but, but I, don't, I don't want you to answer that way. I don't want you to say, I'm a good person, I live for my spouse, I live for this, I live for that. I want you to just really soak that question in and ask yourself, what am I living for? Today, not the past week, not the past month, maybe you've been good for the past year, maybe you've been living for Christ. But I want to know today, when you woke up this morning, because of this message, I woke up and said, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I can say it with confidence, because God wrote to my heart this week, and he showed me that, man, everything else falls so short. It's so insufficient. It is so just unsatisfying. For to me, to live is Christ, and to God die is gain. Now, this is a continual process. I'm not there. I haven't reached it. Even Paul says, listen, I'm not, I'm not there, but that's my goal. That's my goal, to live as Christ, to die, gain. Is that your goal this morning? I hope it is. I hope that's your objective, that's your priority this morning, to live, to be Christ, and to die as gain. And 
I want to fill in the blank. If we can put the, the fill in the blank up there. I want us to do a thing real quick. And I just want you to fill in. Just be honest with yourself. You don't have to say this out loud. I did this week, this week, and I got multiple answers. And it wasn't to live as Christ and to die as gain. For me to live is what? Money? And to die is what? Lose it all? For me to live is what? Popularity or fame? And to die is to mean nothing? For me, maybe you're a little more noble. For me to live is my family. Once again, to die, potentially lose them. What if they go before you and you're left alone? Then what are you living for? You see, the only thing that fits perfectly in that, in that context, the only thing that works there is for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Where are we, church? Where are you, believer? Is that your desire? To live for Christ? To make him your aim, to make him your goal. Now, man, if, if you're if you're just holding on for dear life in your life, and you're like, I'm trying to trust in God, this seems like a, a monumental, huge step to think that you can actually live your, your whole life for Jesus Christ. But I want to encourage you to start small. I ask you to, to want to want to live for Jesus. You know, just, just start there. Just say, you know, I, I don't have it all together. I'm not even close to being a spiritual so-and-so, and I know I'm not, and I don't know a lot about the Bible, but here's where I want to start. I want to want Jesus Christ to be everything in my life. I want to want Jesus to, to, to mean so much to me that, that dying is a kind of a good thing. Not in a morbid way, but in a way that says, you know what, if death comes, it's all right. You know, this, this verse and this particular word in here, uh, is talking about the body. Paul talks about the body for me to, to, to live as Christ and to die as gain. They refer to it as, as a tent. And so when they died, they basically were just packing up the tent, moving on. Is that how you think about death? Is that how, how, how we think about death in, in our lives? And it, it's so encouraging to know that if we simply live for Christ, all the things of this life, man, they don't mean that much anymore. It don't seem so all fire and important. It doesn't seem like such a colossal thing. And, and when you live for Jesus Christ, all the trials, all the circumstances, all the things in your life are really put into perspective. And it takes this heavy, heavy, heavy weight off your shoulders. And you're able to say, you know, no matter what happens in my life, my life's about Christ. He's enough. He's enough for me. Is he enough for you? I'm not talking about playing church. I'm not talking about reading your Bible. I'm not talking about prayer. I'm not talking about all those individual things. I'm talking about a person. A single person. And living your life for that single person. And that person is Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me? Father God, we thank you for letting us see in your word. The Apostle Paul and his influence, his testimony. God, that he wanted to live for Christ. And Lord, he considered it even more gain to die because he would be able to be with you. I pray, Lord, for our members here this morning, for our folks here that are visiting. I pray, God, that you would reach into their heart, help them to see that it's worth it. It's worth it to live for you, to make Jesus Christ their aim, to make Jesus Christ their goal, to make you everything in your life. You will not disappoint. God, you will fulfill them with every fulfilling thing they need. God, that you will be everything to them if they will simply make you their life. I pray, God, that you would reach into our hearts, that your spirit would move amongst us, and that people would make the decisions they need to make this morning and not care about what anybody else thinks, but, God, that they would answer to you and to you alone. We thank you, praise you, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before we begin to sing here in a moment, would you guys stand with me? We're going to worship here in a minute. I want to give you the opportunity to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning. It's more than doing good works or good deeds. It's simply putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, today can be the day of salvation for you. Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. It's simply saying, I ask for forgiveness. I know I can't save myself, and I trust in Jesus. I believe in him, and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. And then, Christian, I want to challenge you this morning. What are you living? What are you living? Wrestle with that thought today. Burn it into your heart and your head. There aren't those things that I was mentioning earlier. They're good things. Family, friends, and loved ones, spouses, children. Those are good things. Those are good things in this life. But they're not the thing in this life. Jesus Christ wants us to live for him. All those things are <coughs> blessing if we do that. Maybe you need to spend some time with the Lord. 
you'd like to talk with one of our, our encouragers this morning, we have some folks down here in these corners. If you're a lady, Nikki's here. If you're a man, Mike's here. They want to just talk with you. If you need to pray with somebody, they'll be here for about five, ten minutes after service, and they'll go in a private room with you and pray with you about anything you want. But maybe you just need to use these altars this morning. Come alone and pray to the Lord and get things right with them or just praise Him. Whatever you need to do this morning, go ahead and do it. 